Well, good afternoon. Welcome to the S.J. Hall Lecture on Industrial Forestry. I'm Keith Gillis, Dean of the College of Natural Resources and a professor of forest economics. So the topic of this lecture is near and dear to my heart. Uh, I'm delighted to have one of our own coming back to give us our presentation today, Professor Heinrich Speaker. Um, before we do, I'd like to give a little bit of background on the S.J. Hall Lecture Series. Uh, Mr. Hall established the Forest Economics Foundation in order to advance understanding uh, and practice of sound economic principles among forestry students. Uh, after he passed away in 1968, his, wife, his widow, uh, Mrs. Desi Hall, moved to uh, establish the S.J. Hall Lectureship at Berkeley. Uh, Desi Hall and the uh, Forest Economics Foundation also established a chair in forest economics the S.J. Hall Endowed Chair in Forest Economics. That's uh, something I had the privilege of holding at one point in my career here in Berkeley. It's currently held by Professor Peter Burke, my esteemed colleague uh, uh, who is here with us today. Um, Mr. Hall uh, stands out in that period of forestry when he was active, uh, recognizing the potential of young growth stands on the West Coast. And in 1948, he and two partners acquired an area of cutover uh, redwood lands to establish the Gualala Redwoods Company. Uh, that company quickly emerged as a leader in the management of young growth redwood. He very strongly felt, as you might imply from his establishing the foundation, uh, that an economic understanding is basic to effective forestry in a strong nation. This is something I tried over and over to get across to students in my forest economics class. Sometimes it worked, sometimes they weren't listening very well, but uh, I, I, I hold that belief as well. And in keeping with that sentiment, we're honored to have this, this annual lecture. Um, we're very fortunate that Desi had the foresight and the generosity to allow us to uh, establish this lecture with the funding to hold this annual event. And I'd like to uh, welcome and recognize some members of the Hall family who've made it here and continue to come to this event as, as part of a family tradition, and we're always happy to see them. Uh, Susan Hall, uh, David and Dorothy Hall, along with their son Kenneth and his wife Patty Dilko are here with us today. Thank you very much for your continued participation in this event. We can give them a hand. Um, we'll be holding the uh, California Alumni Foresters Banquet uh, after our lecture today, and all are welcome at the reception in the garden patio, which is out this way after the lecture. Um, at about 6.15, uh, we'll have the folks that aren't staying for the Alumni Foresters Dinner and Business Meeting can, can head out, and then we'll move in at 6.30 into the dinner. Uh, at the end of Heinrich's presentation, we're going to have a question and answer that uh, Kevin and O'Hara and I will, will run. Uh, if you've got some questions uh, as we're going along, thank them up, but wait for the microphone uh, to get to you because we do record these events and we actually get a much larger uh, number of people accessing these events online than we actually have coming to the meetings. And so to capture your question, we actually need you to wait for the microphone, otherwise it won't, it'll just be a dead spot on, on the film. So wait for the microphone, even if you think you have one of those forestry voices that carries through the woods magnificently. Um, and the video will be posted on the college website afterwards. Uh, everyone take the opportunity to do the, the, the technology check that's necessary. Mine's off, hope yours is too. Uh, so, my pleasure to welcome to the podium Professor Kevin O'Hara from the Department of Environmental Science, Policy, and Management. And I'm very grateful to Kevin that he actually suggested this year's speaker to us. So, Kevin. Well, thank you. It is a great pleasure to uh, welcome Heinrich Speaker here to the uh, University of California. Professor Speaker is professor and director of the Institute for Forest Growth at the Faculty of Forestry and Environmental Studies at the University of Freiburg, what's also known or traditionally known as Albert Ludwig's University. He grew up in the Black Forest region of Southwest Germany. He received his undergraduate degree from the University of Freiburg as well as his doctorate. Uh, since then, he's become one of the most active researchers in the area of silviculture and forest management in Europe. 
Um, I can personally attest to this and that it seems like just about every topic that I look into from forest pruning to uneven age silviculture that I find a seminal paper by Professor Speaker that's uh, dominating the field. Um, however, it wasn't until I met him about 10 years ago in a meeting in Austria that I learned that he was actually an alumni of this university, that he was actually a Cal Forester. Um, but he earned his Master of Science degree here in forest economics in 1971. Uh, during his distinguished career, Professor Speaker has authored over 100 scientific papers. He has served as a board member of the International Union of Forest Research Organizations, or UFRO, chair of the scientific board of the European Forest Institute. He has served as dean of the faculty of the, the forest faculty at the University of Freiburg, served on the advisory committee for scientific development of the Chinese Academy of Forestry as a fellow of the European Forest Institute, and in 2005 received the Schigwaffer Prize, a European Innovation Award. Uh, after a decade of uproar over a feared decline in growth of European forests, Professor Speaker led a European-wide scientific effort to shed light on this issue. And among the conclusions from this effort that he coordinated were that the growth of many European forests wasn't declining at all, it was actually increasing. Um, he serves on many editorial boards and has appointments to universities at the university, uh, at universities in the US, Canada, and Brazil. Today, Professor Speaker is speaking on multi-purpose forestry, an option for the future. So please join me in welcoming a Cal Forester back to Berkeley. Thank you. Dear whole family, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to give a talk here about multipurpose forestry. Uh, dear Keith and dear Kevin, thank you for your very kind introductory words. I feel very comfortable back here in Berkeley after 40 years. And I was able to walk this morning through the campus and actually around the Mall for Tall where I was working. Things have not even changed too much. Even now, talking to the people about the regulations and things going on here in forestry in California, though so things have changed a little bit since the time I was here. So I am not sure whether my talk about multipurpose forestry really fits exactly to California. I put it in a wider way and I will talk about it more on a worldwide perspective. And first of all, I would uh, like uh, to talk, what, is multi what does multipurpose forestry mean? Well, it's easy if you look to the term multipurpose, it means that it's not only one purpose, but uh, several purposes that have to be taken into account. And opposed to this is specialized forestry, which is, is, is designated primarily for just one purpose, for instance, for wood production or mainly for protection or just for recreation. So what are those purposes? Maybe it's not really very new for you. There are these protection purposes soil fertility, protection against erosion and so on, biodiversity, wilderness, rockfall or avalanches, and there is water, water quality, wood, timber and fiber, carbon sequestration, a new topic. Actually, when I was here at Berkeley 40 years ago, nobody would understand carbon sequestration. What does it mean? And cultural values, spiritual values, recreational values, other social services, not to forget jobs and income and rural development. I would like to give a more historical view now on how have purposes designated to forest. And worldwide, one can distinguish, from my point of view, uh, three phases of forest development. The first phase, and it seems to happen somehow everywhere, is a forest exploitation and overuse of the forest, which has happened actually in Europe some thousand years ago. A second phase where people realize it cannot continue like this. We have to restore our forest. And then a third phase, we are not happy with what we have reforestated. We need to convert it into some other kind of forest. And it is quite interesting to see that this sequence happens almost everywhere. People are not learning from errors. 
So let's look to this first phase of forest exploitation. Some natural forests are destroyed and either some are kept or others are changed to other land uses and uh, sometimes also then replanted with plantations. Then we have the second phase of forest restoration where people invest to restore the forest and generally those are plantation, quite often also for the purpose of producing wood. And then we have a second phase where we are not happy with some of the plantations and we convert them to other forests. And this ends up quite often in multipurpose forestry. Let's go look to some examples on the first phase of forest exploitation. Examples from uh, Amazon in Brazil, from New Zealand, South Africa, <coughs> and history in Europe. Here, a uh, view on the Amazon forest, natural forest, in most places still rather untouched. But individual trees are sometimes already cut, even in, a, in some areas, on a sustainable way. And sometimes the gaps are becoming bigger and the land is used in different ways. And it even then replanted with plantations, like here with the tea plantations or also with eucalypt plantations. A few uh, years earlier, in the south of Brazil, there were still natural forest left. I was there working in 1975. There were still about 30% of the natural forest left. Today, it's just 5% left. So here's this phase of exploitation has been ended and people are now replanting and we will see later plantations in these areas. In New Zealand, we have still find a lot of natural forest but some forests have to be have been changed to plantations. In South Africa, you also can see natural forests mainly on the hilly sides and on the more easy accessible sides, plantations after removing the natural forests. In Europe, this phase of overexploitation has started much earlier, almost already a thousand years ago. And the people were very inventive to find ways how to use the forest. If the for forest was more remote, then people first changed the wood to charcoal in order to transport it to the places where the energy was needed. Or they found ways to transport the wood down the rivers. And because of all these technologies, they were able to even exploit forest far away from the consumers. And the goats also helped to destroy what was left, and at the end, in many parts of Europe, only a few trees were left. This, in, in 1350, less than 20% of the land was still covered with forest. So then came, of course, uh, the phase of forest restoration. People realized it cannot continue like this, and I will give you examples from China, southern Brazil, and again from Europe. So here a picture from China, after the forest was destroyed, people planted in many places monocultures with eucalypt, like here, or with uh, Konigamia, the China fir, and mainly monocultures on huge areas, millions of hectares. And here, for instance, in this southern area of China, in 2008, a uh, heavy ice storm destroyed a, a huge amount of these plantations. So people not always had good experience. Another example from Brazil, after this destruction of the natural forest, here a quite successful plantation of uh, fast-growing eucalypt trees with a production of more than 50 cubic meters per hectare and year. This forest is nine years old and 30 meters high. Or in Europe, a successful plantation of uh, Norway spruce. As some of you might know, Norway spruce is not very common naturally in Europe, but because of human activities, we have now huge plantations of Norway spruce. 
But also with the Norway spruce, people were not always happy. They were often planted outside of the natural range. They were susceptible to storm, as you can see here, or to insects and diseases. Though people are thinking, did we do something wrong? Was our plantation of this Norway spruce monocultures the right way to go? So the benefits of the specialized plantations are clear. They are often highly productive. They produce tailor-made uh, timber and, fi and, and uh, fiber, and they are relatively easy to manage. However, the negative aspects of these plantations were higher risks of pests and diseases, eventually also disappointing productivity, soil degradation, and loss of biodiversity. So, then people thought we need to change those, at least some of those plantations to another type of forest. So we need to convert these plantations towards less vulnerable forests, towards more diverse forests, towards more close to nature forests. The species should be site adapted, the forest should be ecologically stable and self-regulating processes should be applied also because of economic reasons. So continuous cover forestry became more attractive and finally multi-purpose forestry. So we may ask the question, how much Norway spruce plantation do we need and how much should be converted this is a quite heavily discussed question right now. We may diversify species, like you can see on this picture. And we may also think about producing higher quality timber, because the quality makes a difference when it comes to the price of the wood. We may think of longer production periods, like here these oaks are more than 300 years old, and at that time when the picture was taken, it was still a regular managed forest, where the timber was cut regularly. Or you might select certain species uh, by, uh, which are of special value, or of uh, either wood value or ecological value. You might even think about artificial pruning of individual trees in order to improve the quality of the products. And you may apply selective cutting, cuttings in order to uh, ensure a continuous income and also a continuous cover in respect to protection functions, for instance, protection against erosion or rockfall. You may also think about admix. Spe uh, highly productive species like uh, Douglas fir, which is growing very well on many sites in uh, Europe and uh, still uh, have uh, close to nature forests, but at the same time are highly productive and well to the changing condition adapted species. Here are an example from China where people realized that pure plantation may not be all the best for everywhere, and here a plantation of multipurpose forests using native species, a mixture of native species. So how should we now finally designate the purpose to forests? If you look worldwide, about a little bit more than 50% of the purposes are uh, uh, de designated to production and multiple, uh, multiple use. But then there are other functions, as you can see here on this slide, uh, social services, conservation, protection, and assets. And if we look to the development, how these different functions developed, then we can see that the area of planted forest has increased in all continents. And it has actually drastically increased. The area of planted forest is increasing about 5 million hectares uh, during the period from 2000 to 2010. And all over the world, we observe a similar development. At the same time, we observe 
that the trends of area of forest designated for conservation also increased. In the last 20 years, about 60 million hectares of conservation forests have been designated to this conservation. So also here we see a clear trend. So in other words, we can see a trend towards specialization. On which type, uh, types of sites do we see this specialized forest? Let's first have a look to the forest specialized for production. We find them mainly on sites that are, have highly product productivity, low vulnerability, good accessibility, short distance to the market. And when we talk about distance to the market, we have to think about the means that we use for the transport. Because if we use, for instance, a truck uh, and travel 200 kilometers, then we have an equivalent of emissions and costs as using an ocean ship and we travel 6,000 or 7,000 kilometers. So the transport distance really depends very much on the means which you use. And we have to have skilled labor to, if possible, relatively low cost and no conflict with other purposes. That was production. Here are some examples. You have seen this picture before, highly productive forest, though that is uh, excellent examples for productive and successful plantations. This is an example for poor results. The species just was not site adapted and the genetic material was not uh, adequately selected. Here you have a nice example to demonstrate the importance of accessibility. Those areas that were easy accessible and uh, fertile were used for plantation and the other parts were left to natural forests. And here you see this example where we have high vulnerability and where we might think that these plantations were not really a success and we have to find other ways to manage forests. Or another picture from China, looking to China fir, also here you can easily see that this forest is not at all stable and uh, this plantation also failed to produce a sustainable forest system. And when we look to protection, which sites are most favorable for protection forest? Then, of course, the highly vulnerable sites, the sites of special ecological value, like riparian sites, rare species, or special forest types, or uh, sites of special touristic uh, relevance. And Finally, uh, sp uh, sites of special cultural value. Here are also some examples. This forest mainly serves for protection against avalanches. This forest, as you can see, protects against rockfall. This forest is just left for to observe uh, natural processes and to protect this natural processes. This is a forest for recreational values in China. This as well, recreational value or spiritual value. So we find specialized forests often in regions that are consisting of sites that are heterogeneous, like we have seen in New Zealand, in South Africa, and Brazil. We find uh, uh, specialized forests mainly on sites where other purposes are of significant lower priority. So production forests we find mainly on abundant agricultural land, on unproductive exploited secondary forests, on sites having low pressure of urban society. On the other hand, we find protected forests mainly on sites 
which emphasizes on soil protection, water protection, rockfall, etc., or on sites with endangered species, or on sites with special interest for the public. On these heterogeneous sites, it's relatively easy to find consensus between different interest groups. However, how about those sites that it well suit for plantation as for protection? Here, may multipurpose forestry be the solution? The question is how the purposes are interrelated in the, in the production process. They could be complementary. That means if one purpose is better fulfilled, the other is as well better fulfilled. That would be the easy case. Or they could be independent from each other. That would leave you a lot of flexibility. Or they would be conflicting. And that is, of course, a difficult case. Graphically, we could describe it like this. That would be the complementary case. If you increase one purpose, the other purpose is as well increased. These are the independent cases where increase one has no effect, increase one has no effect on the other, or like here. And that is a conflicting case. If you increase one, the other is reduced. The management intensity is also has an effect on this interaction between the purposes. If we have low intensity, we find generally also low interaction between the purposes. And if we have high intensity, we have a strong interaction between the purposes. For instance, high intensity by applying herbicides, plowing, stand improvement, and so on, may generate conflicting outputs with, for instance, protection values. What multipurpose management option do we actually have? We have actually quite many options because in the production process, these purposes are not technically fixed and we can have all kinds of combinations of options when we think about forestry. Though we can have uh, management option area where many different options and now we can think about which one would we probably choose. We would choose those ones, oh, those ones that are at the surface of these uh, options that are either best maximizing the production of, of value, of wood value, or maximizing the nature conservation values. And now the question is, if we have a specialized forest, can we convert it to a multipurpose forest and how can we convert it? So that means we want to, have we, when we have a specialized forest for wood production, we now want to move it towards producing more natural conservation values. And the question is, can this be done easily, how much costs are related to it. If the costs are very high, if it's difficult, maybe that would not be the right idea to change to a multipurpose forest. So we have to look what are the options. One way to move towards more multipurpose forestry is to protect ecologically especially valuable areas or individuals, to avoid damages to soil fertility, for instance, by reducing soil compactions nutrient depletions and erosions, to increase habitat values by leaving some old trees or some dead wood, or increasing the protection value by having a continuous cover forestry on sensitive sites, or uh, activities to increase the recreational value. Here are some examples from Finland where they leave uh, um, dead trees and groups of trees in order to keep the forest more diverse without much economic loss. 
But how can a protected forest convert, be converted in a multipurpose forest? There are there also opportunities to increase the production value of such a protected area? Well, we can, per, for instance, allow just moderate stand improvement or allow selective cutting of individual trees or allow for some infrastructure for a road network or prevent flower, uh, fires without at the same time reducing significantly the conservation value of the area. For instance, leaving buffer strips and so on. Also here are some examples. Improving the value of production by admixing exotic species. Allowing the cut only of individual trees. So we move from uh, just a production forest to a multi-purpose forest. Releasing and pruning specifically selected trees, but not touching other areas of the forest, and also using natural processes. For choosing the best options, the trade-offs between the competing purposes has to be quantified. The choice depends on the value system of the decision makers. And the decision maker may be the landowners, the society, and so on. So if we think about a nature conservation a specialist, an NGO, he might have this kind of value system, which means for him, the nature conservation value are very high, and compared to this, the wood production value are very low. So he would give up a lot of production and move a little bit more towards a higher nature conservation value. The urban society may be a little bit more moderate. They would allow uh, some in, uh, reduction of nature conservation by increasing wood production, but they may have such a kind of value system. And finally, the forest owner that is living from forestry, he might, of course, have a high preference for wood value and he would give up quite a bit of nature conservation value in order to increase the wood production. So in other words, depending on whom you are asking, the value system will be different. And now if we go back to our management options, the nature conservationist will probably look for this kind of multipurpose forestry with the urban society may go somewhere in between and now you can easily guess the forest owner would maybe choose this option. So he, just to have a, because of his feeling of responsibility, he would also take care of natural values, but he would not give up very much of the wood value production. And the next question is, is the option, the best options that have been chosen today also the best option for the future. And there we have these problems that forest management has long-term impacts and we have to take future changes and uncertainties into account. And looking back only a few decades, you will recognize yourself how fast things are changing. And we have ecological uncertainties we don't know really how site conditions will change. For instance, it was said by Kevin before that we did a study about site conditions and we found out trees today grow faster in Europe than they grew 50 years ago. And that was really unexpected. So it's, there is uncertainty. And we talk a lot about climate change, but nobody knows really in which direction climate will change, but it will change. And we have uncertainties with invasive species more than ever, and pests and diseases, catastrophic events. And we have also technological uncertainties. We don't know how fast science is developing all kinds of techniques, genetic improvement, harvesting techniques, logistics, and so on. And we have economic uncertainties. 
changes of market conditions. And that is just obvious in the last years we saw so, uh, big changes going on. The value of forest products, labor cost, transportation cost, and so on. And very often the social uncertainties are for, for, forgotten. And they are even, from my point of view, the most important. People's perceptions and values change so rapidly and very difficult to predict. Now I can look back, since I studied in Berkeley 40 years ago, and now when I go to those excursions which I have done as a student and think about what we discuss today about the same excursion, about the same forest, it's a totally different picture. So people's mind and people's value are changing really fast. And at the same time, of course, the laws and restrictions and subsidies are changing. So we have to live with really many uncertainties and are dealing with a long-lasting system. Now the question, can multipurpose forestry help us in these uncertain conditions? Well, multipurpose forestry per se implies to serve several purposes. And therefore, there is a chance to serve uncertain future needs. The chance are higher under a multipurpose forestry system than in a segregated forest that is specialized for a specific purpose. So my conclusion is that multipurpose forestry has a higher capacity to adapt to changing conditions. And this question of high capacity is for me a key question of forest management, which has in the past, at least from my point of view, not taken sufficiently into account. So whenever we think about management options, we should think about do they increase the adaptive capacity. Here we have a specialized forest that under one specific condition produces an excellent result. And here we have a multipurpose forest that under the same conditions is not really producing the same value, but may produce higher values under other conditions. Though, in other words, this system has an higher adaptive capacity. And this is, as I said before, from my point of view, a value per se. The adaptation of forest, to, uh, the adaptation capacity of forest also depends on how easy they are, can be converted from one system to another. And here I have listed five systems from unmanaged nature reserve to close to nature management, multipurpose forestry, even age forestry, and to biomass production. So you can see increase in management intensity. And now if we think, can we easily move from one system to another? So we can say it's relatively easy to move in this direction. To move from an unmanaged nature, natural forest to a plantation, that's easy. Clear cut and plant one species, and then you're done. But how about moving the other direction? If you have a productive monoculture and you would like to have a close to nature forest or even a nature reserve, this is a very difficult task, if not impossible. So if we look to this slide, we would conclude to increase adaptive capacity, we have to be more close to nature or more multipurpose forestry would allow us more flexibility to move to another management system than if we have a highly intensive management system. This is also demonstrated here again. For instance, the restoration of a species-rich tropical forest is almost impossible. Also, of course, an old growth natural forest would take many decades, if not centuries, to be re-established. So some concluding remarks. There is a worldwide consensus that forest management should be sustainable. There is also consensus that land use should be efficient. Land use should provide the greatest permanent benefit to people. And this is today more relevant than ever before because we are aware we need renewable resources. 
and that means also efficient land use. There is also consensus that we need wilderness areas. But the question remains how much and under which conditions. This is a big discussion going on right now in our Black Forest area where people ask for more and more wilderness area. But on the other hand, this means a loss of production capacity. There is consensus nowadays that we need more renewable resources. And of course, plantations are well suited to provide these renewable resources. But also here the question remains, how much plantation under which conditions? Besides conservation forestry, plantation, and plantation forestry, multipurpose forestry can contribute substantially to the well-being of people. Multipurpose forestry provides various goods and services at the same time. In, at, it can, as I said before, easily adapt it to changing conditions. For optimizing multipurpose forestry, we need, however, to know how to cope with conflicts of, between purposes, how to evaluate these purposes, and to, how to allocate the cost to the specific purposes, which is a difficult task. Decisions on multipurpose forestry should not be based on emotions and ideology, which is often the case, unfortunately. A, host, a holistic approach is needed that takes into account ecology as well as socio-economic reality. And therefore we have the challenge that all people involved in decision making are adequately informed. Multipurpose forestry as we have heard before, is very variable and has to be adapted to the specific local condition. In order to achieve this, skilled and highly motivated professionals are needed. So forest science and forest education are key elements for a successful multipurpose forestry. And this is one task that's a University of California in Berkeley has also to take care of to, to promote this forest science and education and to allow skilled and motivated professionals for the future. So, and with these words, I would like to thank you for your attention and I'm open for discussions and questions. So, first questions. I'm gonna take the liberty since I have the mic. Um, you said that you thought the trade-offs between wilderness and production forests that are raging with respect to, you know, Norway spruce and black forest uh, should be not made on emotion, but yes. on quantification of trade-offs. Yes. And my thought when you said that was to think back to Dennis Teagarden's work in the U.S. Uh, roadless area review and evaluation period, where he actually quantified the trade-off between wilderness and timber production values, uh, looking for especially the inflection points. What could you give up uh, before the cost became too severe? Do you find in the European context that information like that has credibility in the, in the social debate? Unfortunately, if I see what is going on right now, as I told you, we have exactly these discussions where People want to set a bar, uh, aside a larger area. It's very emotional, very political, and science plays almost no role. And the question is, does science do something wrong? 
and I look to the newspapers and how the decisions is going on, some scientists are involved, but the wilderness specialists, and they want to have more wilderness. But the economists who really look to all aspects, they have little say, but they are also, not, unfortunately, only little involved in these processes. But people believe in science. So the, this group is really very important. But it is not only that they are not so much involved, the questions are also not so easy. How to compare the values, and sometimes also the natural science base is not clear enough. People want to protect certain species, and that's why they ask, you don't, shouldn't manage your forest, but without management, the habitats may be even worse than with management. And these relations are also very often poorly understood. So from my point of view, this is really a challenge for science in the future, for the cooperation of natural scientists with the economists. And this is not really functioning so well, at least from my point of view. Professor Speaker, I wanted to ask you if uh, multipurpose forests require more human intervention to keep them in that condition as uh, compared with, let's call them single purpose uh, forests uh, due to perhaps some species uh, um, reproducing faster uh, or outcompeting for resources. How, how do you keep the balance in a multipurpose forest? That is an interesting question. And if you would uh, talk about uh, intensity of intervention when it comes to hours and manpower, I would say less. When it comes to input of intelligence, I would say more. So in other words, a multipurpose forest requires more skills, better understanding of the processes, better understanding of nature, because you can better use natural processes. And that's why Multipurpose forestry only works if you have skilled people in the field. Those that do the planning, those that work, the forest worker itself has to have better education. So you need better skilled people, but they don't need more hours to work. Uh, Professor Speaker, uh, I'd like to ask a question that relates to scale. Uh, and it also relates to you know, what is the definition of a forest. And the question I would ask relates to one of your slides that where you, you presented some options range, with about five options ranging from a natural forest down to uh, biomass. And so the specific question could be asked, uh, rather than look as your slides depict as you know, the complexity and diversity in what I would call a forest stand. What if you look at, say, a watershed level, or even larger, and argue that in this watershed, or in this region, I have examples and allocations of everything from natural forests through to biomass. Now, couldn't I argue that on the watershed scale, I have multi-purpose watershed as opposed to a multi-purpose, much smaller scale, what I would call a stand. Your question is really very relevant, the scale. Is it a landscape or is it even an area of a nation or is it an individual forest stand? And you already gave the answer almost yourself partly, what is a forest? You, you, you have a, a management unit that can be a forest. You, from an ecological point, maybe you may look to the landscape. And indeed, uh, when I talk about multipurpose forest, I did not really differentiate very carefully what scale I am talking about. But depends also on where you are. If I'm talking about scales in New Zealand, it would be easy. I have a plantation scale and I have these uh, natural forests and there I have huge for, for areas and there I would talk about large scale. But when I talk about the black forest, where there are these many small owners, then I talk about small scale in, in this specific situation where I talk then 
the forest owner practice multi-purpose forest in his own 40, 50, 100 hectares. While in New Zealand, it wouldn't make sense to do it like this because of accessibility on totally different situations. That's why I did not really precisely differentiate the scales. It depends on where you are when you talk about multipurpose forestry. Uh, I was interested in your slide that depicted uh, the, the range of risk of a multipurpose forest as opposed to a single or narrow focused yep. forest. And you know, it's, it's interesting to me as, a, as one who is specialized in investment forestry, and I've, I've often found that e economics frequently boils down to simply discounted cash flow analysis, which is really kind of a a, a perverse uh, depiction of human behavior when faced with risk and, yeah, yeah. and its short-term nature. And I wonder if multipurpose forestry in, in, in that context is really uh, hopelessly dominated by short-term motivation. Um, I, I would actually just uh, there is the opposite. When you have plantations, you are short-term motivated because generally plantations have short rotation. I'm, I'm thinking now about short rotation, highly productive, uh, and those are from the investment point of view probably the most attractive. But it's not, especially if you include the value of the capital that is in the forest. If you only use, uh, calculate the investment that you do with your activities, then it might look differently because you, in a multipurpose forest, as I said before, you invest intelligence, but not so many man hours. While in a plantation, you invest a lot of man power in a short term because you have this high productivity and heavy cutting. So, well, my perspective was here not really so much uh, just business economic oriented. But my perspective was more maximizing the value of the land for the people in the long run, sustainably. And then multipurpose gets interesting. But if you just look from an investment point of view, then you would probably go for a plantation in a highly productive forest. And, and there's, there is a controversial and uh, uh, this is not so easy to, to solve. And, and now it comes also a difference in mentality. Uh, you described a person that we know in Northern Europe, like in Sweden or Finland. And you, if you look how their forest is managed, very often monocultures, relatively short rotation. That means something like 60, 70, 30, uh, 80 years which is short for these low productive sites. And now when you go to more to the south, to Germany, people have this, what I told from history, they have also already inherited productive forests that have been reestablished uh, even sometimes several hundred years ago. And they just harvest and plant in a sustainable, continuous way. And they don't even calculate interest rate. And they are happy with it. If you ask a forest owner about interest rate, he wouldn't know how, what to answer. But they live from the forest. Though it really depends also very much on mentality and history and culture. Forgive me if I sit down because I don't think I can stand very long. I'm just sitting here thinking about your comment uh, that emotion should not play a role in the decision-making process. And uh, the question I would ask, is there not a way of using em emotion constructively in the decision-making process? It seems to me to, to rule it out is impossible. There has to be some sort of process involved. and. Uh, an expert on this is sitting to my right, Doug Lees, <laughs> who headed up uh, 
an, an agency that developed an experiment with all kinds of public participation processes, which I would interpret to be an attempt to um, not direct emotion, but to uh, melt from it what is valuable to take into account in making a decision. And in the, in the case of multi, multi-purpose forests, so many of the values are not, not measured in any objective way. The emotional aspect of it is just simply unavoidable. So I appreciate your comment and what you've seen around the world as to, as to methods for dealing with the emotional content uh, in a constructive way. Well, uh, Dennis, listening to you, I, I, I would right away agree with you. The reality is that final emotions are more important when it comes to decision making than all other arguments. Uh, but that is scary, especially when we deal with an urbanized society that does not really know much about it and then uh, participates in the decision making process and generally it goes in the direction to protect nature for and and uh, this I, is understandable and should not be ignored that would be totally a misunderstanding of what i want to say but the idea is that somehow it should be possible and that's why science plays here an important role the so society listens to science they don't listen to, to, the, to, the, to the industry, or, but they, they, they listen to scientists, and if the scientist uh, tries to bring in the discussion arguments that are useful and not just emotional, then maybe we can improve decision-making. That, that was my point. Uh, but I, I, I agree totally with you. The, we have to live, or, and if we would ignore the emotion, we would be totally out of the world. Uh, you, you seem to suggest a scientist is somehow, they're somehow free of emotion. I, I'm sure that's not quite what you mean, but I, I have yet to meet a scientist in any aspect of forestry that I know of who could really make the claim that in the end he or she was completely free of some emotional bent in one direction or another. Now I realize science, the, the, the standard for good science is, is the opposite, but very, it's very easy to hide uh, the biases that are often inherent in the decisions that are recommended by scientists. I, I, I state that as an observation based upon my years in, uh, in, in American forestry and thinking about the role of scientists. And it seems to me that uh, what many people, when they challenge science, what they're, what they're really challenging is the subjective part of the decision that went into the recommendation that the scientists came up with? Well, uh, you described the reality quite well, and I, I don't have to say anything uh, in contrast to this. But uh, still, uh, the purpose of science is to uh, bring more uh, arguments in it to finally come up to, when it comes now to, to multipurpose forestry, to make better use of the resources. That is the aim of, of my talk, is actually to think about what, what should we do in order to best use our resources for all kinds of purposes. And without science, we cannot improve the use. You probably agree with me in this respect as well. But especially when it comes to forestry, emotions are very important, it's, it's quite strange. When you look to land use for agriculture, nobody cares, at least up to now. Now we, we are starting to talk about habitats in agricultural land. It was for a long time, no, anybody cared about it at all. But as soon as this is a forest, everybody cares. So here's the emotion aspect is much more important and somehow people feel that forests are more nature and they want to keep nature and care of nature, which is, understandable and, and it's, it's good that people think in, in this way uh, uh, but uh, I, I think science plays here a role to make the best of the, of, of, of the resources available and with emotion alone you don't come to the best decisions that, that would be my point of view <clears throat> many of the changes that have taken place in American forest policy 
have been the result of legislative act action, such as the Wilderness Act, uh, that <clears throat> basically established a wilderness system and uh, instructed the Forest Service to set aside land. Is this multiple, multiple purpose forestry that you are describing uh, being promoted by legislation, or is this just a good idea that some people are trying to promote? And what do you see as its future? Well, I, I discussed before I gave this lecture a little bit with uh, people living here and people having forests here. And when listening to them, I got the impression that legislation and regulation alone uh, may not be the best way to promote multipurpose forestry. It may be even a way to slow down any forest management and use. So. From this, I can already say, evidently, legislation alone does not ensure multipurpose forestry. So my understanding is more, and now I come from, a, from, from Europe, from Germany, where the forest owner has evidently more freedom than here, but he feels the responsibility to not just work for one purpose, but take to, into account other purposes. So, to answer your question, I don't think that you can do it just by legislation. It's also a matter of culture and responsibility because to control every step in forest management is almost impossible. So at the local level, you need a decentralized system where the manager himself takes the responsibility to take care of the dis different purposes. Maybe that's also a little bit idealistic thinking uh, but uh, that would be my point of view. I was just wondering if you could talk a little bit about your experience as a student at Cal coming from Germany. About my? Experience at Cal coming from Germany as a student? Uh, excuse me, I don't understand. Uh, uh, about uh, my experience about? Your, your, um, your your life at Cal, or at Berkeley, when you came from Germany as a oh, student. Oh, okay, now I understand. You, uh, <laughs> the, com the comparison between the systems. Well, that was really, for me, a big difference. I, when I, the first thing was, when I arrived, I could speak only a little bit of English, and people assumed that when you study here, you, cheat, you need to know the language, and so, there was no thinking about how can we help you. So it was, they were had the quarter system at that time, and they said, if you continue like this, how you did in the first quarter, I think you would need to leave the university. But, <laughs> but meanwhile, my English got better, and, and finally I got my degree quite well after a year. And so that was one of the experiences that uh, I had to adapt very fast. And other experience was, that the teaching here was much more advanced. It was always to the point the professors were well prepared and they were really demanding. We had required reading for each lecture and I was busy during the night and during the day the lectures and so on. They really kept me busy, but at the end of the course, you knew you have achieved your aims and you know the subject. And in Germany, this is not always the case. Sometimes you don't like to go to the lectures and you do something else and have more freedom. And, but on the other hand, you have to learn better how to manage time. Here, the time was managed for me. I just have to follow the rules, but there I was responsible for my own activity, which has also advantages, this freedom. So there were a few impressions about my studies. Do you want to hear more? <laughs> <laughs> And also the, 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 the bachelor and master system here was already well established. And I saw the problem uh, of this system also that when you go in a master program, there are students with all kinds of different backgrounds. While in Germany, we had one system from the first year to the last year. So it was the same track. And now we have moved to bachelor and master. Now we are faced with the same problems that people in the master program have different backgrounds. So we are getting more and more equal. We do all the good things that you are doing, but also the bad things. So. <laughs> but 
one thing I forgot since there is right now uh, no question, and, and that is not uh, something I'm just saying. This one year in Berkeley really changed my life. Before that, I wanted to become a black forest forester, and I wanted to go away from home only because my parents lived in the same town where I went to the university, and I wanted to see something else. But after being in Berkeley, for me, I had new ideas. I, I looked to the world in a new dimension, and this really changed my whole later life. So this one year was so important, and that's why I'm now, when I am a professor, helping all students whenever they want to go abroad, I support them and try to give them scholarships, and, and, and there is lots of opportunities. So many of our students go abroad. And whenever you have a student who wants to come to visit us, I, you can be assured I will help him. You had many, you had many people that listened to me, so you, you can come back. <laughs> well, we may have improved on the model a little bit, but we inherited the field from Germany. So the obligation and the, the, um, the learning curve has gone both directions. So thank you very much for reestablishing us with our discipline's roots, which for the American experience is Germany, and uh, for making us all think a little bit uh, not only about the future of forestry, but also about the issue of emotion and science. And I think the one thing that I would assert very strongly is that none of us became foresters without an emotional attachment to forests, right? We did, none of us looked at this as a place to, well, that's a reasonable paycheck. I, I, could, I could become a forester to get a paycheck to do that. That's yeah, all right. No, we, we went into this field because all of us love forests. And thank you very much, Henrik, for sharing with us today. Thank you.